This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. It's not just what you think, but how you think that makes a difference in the outcomes you generate. You make tens of thousands of decisions a day, up to 70,000 according to research. Yet far too many of these decisions are made under emotional duress, stress, anxiety, and pressure. When this happens, the rational control center of your brain is no longer in charge, having been replaced by the emotional control center. Make better decisions. You do not have to emotionally react to events, situations, and people. Within this book, you will find useful and easy-to-implement tips and techniques for taking control of your emotions and thoughts so that you can respond, instead of reacting, to life's daily challenges. Doing so puts you in a position to make more optimal decisions, both personally and professionally. Valeria interviews Stephen Howard, the award-winning author of 21 leadership, management, and professional development books. His most recent works include Better Decisions, Better Thinking, Better Outcomes, How to Go from Mindful to Mindful Leadership, and Eight Keys to Becoming a Great Leader, with leadership's lessons and tips from Gibbs, Yoda, and Captain Jack Sparrow. He is well-known and recognized for his truly international and multicultural perspective, having lived in the USA for over 30 years, in Singapore for 21 years, and in Australia for 12 years. He currently resides in Southern California. Meet Stephen at calienteleadership.com. Here is the interview with Stephen Howard. In your own words, who is Stephen Howard? Well, outwardly, I'm a an, I'm an author. I've written over 20 books. Um, I also do leadership coaching and leadership training. Uh, but inwardly, I'm I guess I'm probably a struggling spiritual form, so to speak, trying to understand and learn from this experience we call life. And so I, I don't like labels so much, other than the word author and coach, I guess. But mostly, I, I try and focus on what am I becoming instead of who who am I today. Before we talk about specifically some of the topics in your book, how stress and anxiety impact decision making, making better decisions, driving better outcomes, I have these warm up questions, as I mentioned off record. So the first one for you had to be this one. What does it mean to be a human being? Oh, to be a human being. Um, well, I, I would say we're spiritual beings having a human experience. Um, you know, we're on a, a what I would consider a temporary journey of discovery, kind of an opportunity for our soul to to grow in the areas that it needs uh, the most growth. Do you connect the soul to the spirit, the higher self, or the creator, the source, God? Yes, all that, except I don't use the terminology God. I think, that personally, I think that's too tied into religion. And I think, you know, man has kind of messed up religion over the years. Um, but, um, yeah, but certainly the, the soul, the spirit are interchangeable um, in, in, my, in, in my thinking anyway. What do you think is the ultimate purpose of the human experience? I think the ultimate purpose is for, uh, I go back to what I mentioned just a moment ago, for the soul to grow. I think um, if, if 
some of us might relate purpose to things like helping others, making society better, things like that. But I think for others of us, um, purpose might be more inwardly driven. Um, maybe it means learning how to control our emotional outbursts or even learning how to love. Uh, and I think that's why I get away from labels, because I think some people say this might look at somebody who's very inwardly focused and say, well, that person's selfish. But maybe that's what that person's journey is all about right now. You mentioned love. So speaking of definitions and labels, what is love to you? Or what are the manifestations of love? Oh, I think when you feel love, you 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 feel a kind of a sense of, of rightness, of, of wholeness. Uh, you, you put another person's earthly goals above your own, um, but you also want to protect them. Um, and, and maybe this is a male thing, I don't know, but you want to protect the other person from harm, danger, strife. But you also have to allow them to grow through their own mistakes and their own stresses and their own hardships. So kind of kind of a balancing act. Uh, but I also believe that love is something that's alive and it needs to be nourished. Uh, I don't believe in this concept of eternal love and or, you know, you're either in love or you fall out of love. I think if, you, if you're in love, you've got to nourish it. It requires hard work to keep love alive between two people. Um, and, if no, you know, no matter how beautiful our love feels, um, if we don't nourish it, it's going to die. Do you believe in unconditional love? I, am, I don't in many respects um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, even if you have a child, but if your child you know murders someone, I mean, I guess you can love aspects of that child, but you can't love them unconditionally if, if they commit that kind of a, a gross act. Uh, again, maybe that is their journey in life. But no, I'm not. A, I don't believe in unconditional love. Do you believe in unconditional self-love? No, for the same reason. I think I think I believe in self love. I think you have to. I think you have to kind of hold yourself to uh, to a kind of a standard too. It'd be kind of uh, hypocritical to say I can love myself unconditionally, but I can't love another human being unconditionally. Mm, that's <laughs> um, true. But, but my version of self love it might be a little different for some of your listeners because um, I think self love is really a discovery. It's a discovery of yourself, meaning discovery of your soul from the start of life to the areas that needs to grow in. But I also think to have self-love, I, I kind of see the soul and the ego in this, in this ongoing battle. So self-love requires a push, a conscious effort for the soul to win over the ego. Uh, and when that happens, and it, you know, it's not going to happen all the time, but when that happens, there's such a moment of pure contentment, pure peace, pure awakeness, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that's, that's self-love. The next two questions, they relate to being a male in a human body. What do you love most about being a man? Love most about being a man? Um, oh, I don't know. I think, um, well, in society, I mean, you know, we have many, many advantages. It's not fair, but it's, it's absolutely true. Men, men have um, many advantages over women in, in society. I think that's getting rectified to some extent, but not in others. Um, I think I'll be honest with you. I, I, I play, I have take pleasure not having to go to the, the monthly menstrual cycle that women have to go through. Uh, and, and I'm very pleased that I don't have to go through childbirth experience. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not big on pain, quite frankly. Okay. <laughs> so I think those are some of the advantages of being a male. What is the most challenging aspect about being a man? I think the ego. I think mm. the, the particularly the way in Western society more. Now, I lived in Asia 21 years, so I kind of have a perspective from both an Asian perspective and a U.S. or Western perspective. But I think particularly in the Western perspective, um, the male ego, we're so driven. I, you know, I often tell the story that, you know, uh, and I know it happened to me. And I, I've discussed this with some of my high school friends in high school. When I showed leadership talent, you know, I started organizing things. My teachers would always say, boy, he's a natural born leader. And when one of the girls tried to do the same thing, the teachers would push them back and say, don't be bossy. You know, you're, it's not your role. And but they were doing the exact same things that I was doing. So I think um, so I think part of it, we feed this ego um, uh, through society, the way we raise children. I'm, I'm hoping that's changing slowly but surely, but I, it's um, just one of my concerns. What is the meaning of freedom to you? What is to be free? 
Ah, I love that question, um, particularly as we approach the U.S. election. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I, I, to me, and I've given this a lot of thought. I used to think, you know, freedom was, you know, my right to do whatever I want as long as I don't harm somebody and as long as I stay within most of the rules of society and push the boundaries to a point. But really, I now I now believe that. Freedom to me means the ability to learn the lessons that I need to learn from my life experiences. So if I've got the freedom to have experiences of, and whether other people like them or not, they're my choice. And I've got that opportunity to, to experience these things and then learn from them. Um, I think that other concept that freedom means the ability to do what I want is, is kind of ego driven, quite frankly. And so I see freedom as doing what my soul needs for its growth. Um, but also, I mean, I, that's from a soul standpoint. I mean, from a human standpoint, I also will tell you that, you know, I, I, I see freedom as the ability to express myself, uh, express my thoughts, express my ideas up through my writing. I've got a YouTube channel, um, my own training programs, the coaching sessions I do. I mean, that to me, that's that's the beauty of, of my professional life. The freedom of my professional life is I can express my thoughts and my ideas. What do you think is the world's greatest need at this time? <sighs> Other than a vaccine for COVID-19, <laughs> right. um, um, but taking a, a bigger perspective, I think transparency and honesty from leaders and from organizations. Now, I guess that comes because I spent a lot of time in the leadership space and teaching leadership and whatever. But I, I see there's a, a lack of trust in the world. I, I, I find it very hard. I mean, what organizations do we trust unconditionally? Going back to the word you used earlier, what leader do we trust unconditionally, whether it's a political leader, a, a government leader or a business leader? I, I don't think there's many in the world. And I think we need to get back to having transparency and honesty from our from our leaders and organizations so that we can rebuild this trust. What are some of the steps to get there? Do you have an idea? What is your vision? I think it's going to take courage. I mean, I, I, I love people. Um, the um, Howard Schultz, who, you know, started um, Starbucks and then came back. I mean, his attitude was he basically said to shareholders, if you're if you're investing in my company to because the profits don't, I mean, I'm putting my employees first, my customers second, and my shareholders third. I mean, you can't be more transparent and honest as a leader than that. And 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 I think we need leaders like that. I think so often we see situations where leaders think they know it or they're afraid what the public might do or what they might think if they know the whole truth. And so they, they give us these sound bites, these partial truths. And I think that that's one of the reasons we have so much discord in the world. We have uh, so much... Um, um, discontent with one another um, and we don't know who to follow in this whole COVID-19. I mean, who do you believe in, in you know, sure. where, where are our experts, where are our leaders in, in understanding how to handle this, this global pandemic? Very good point. Yeah, we don't know who to trust. Yeah, no, right. we yeah. don't. We don't. And I think it's going to take some very courageous people to get up there and 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 say, you know, damn the torpedo, so to speak. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be transparent, and even though it might impact my share price, or even mm. though my customers might walk away from me. But you know what? We're we're going to take a stand here, and we don't have a, enough of those individuals domestically, much much less uh, national or um, worldwide, globally. That concerns me with the election coming up. <laughs> Do we have anyone who is honest, who is transparent? I, I, I and honestly, I don't believe so. I mean, I'm and I, I studied political science in college. That was my degree, and I'm very disappointed. In, and and it's not just the people running. On the national level, I mean, which senators do you trust? Which Congress people do you trust? Which governors do you trust? I think I think it's endemic across our. We have a broken system right now. We have a broken democracy, um, and we're going to need we're going to need that strong leader, right? yeah, that FDR type leader, that Abraham Lincoln type leader, um, maybe even a Harry S. Truman type leader, um, um, to come to to take the reins and, and lead us into uh, into the rest of the the, the 2020s um, decade. I don't, but I don't see anybody on the horizon. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I was about to ask, do you see that coming? Uh, so you don't see anyone. I don't. I mean, there've been a handful. I mean, I, I was, uh, I thought the, um, I thought Howard Schultz when he was going to run, I thought that, well, that was interesting. Let's see what his, his perspective would be. Um, Jim Webb, uh, former U.S. Senator, former Secretary of the Navy. I thought when he started running on the Democratic uh, primaries in 2016, I thought this man, I, 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 I've never seen Jim Webb lie. I've now, you know, I, I thought he had a lot of ethics and, and followed, but he couldn't get enough support. I, and that's, of course, one of the problems. So, so there are these people out there, but 
they, they can't get enough support because they don't sell their souls to the to the political donors and to the the unions and to the 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 uh, political action parties and to the religious institutions and everybody else. So, uh, how how are we going to get them there? I don't know. Because the system has been established by yeah, dishonesty, it's right? Yeah. yeah, it's corrupted. I mean, and it, in many ways, uh, I know we're kind of off topic a little bit, but America is like an empire. Well, the Roman Empire collapsed. The German um, Second and Third Reichs collapsed. The British Empire collapsed. And there's nothing to say that the American Empire is going to last forever. And it's, and all these other empires collapse from internal misuse and and right. and selfishness. And I I see history repeating itself here. Right, and it usually does, yeah. How did you become a writer, Stephen? Well, uh, two two ways. Well, first of all, my father was a fiction writer. My father's a short story writer and a novelist, so I think the part might be might be partly in my blood. Um, I started writing nonfiction, living in Asia. I had a publisher from the UK approach me about a topic that I was pretty knowledgeable in about corporate branding. And uh, we sat down and this guy said I had ideas for a book on corporate branding, unlike any other book that had been out there. And he liked the idea. And so I wrote this book about corporate image management. And it was really about the, the image of the corporation. It had nothing to do with logos and color palettes and all that kind of stuff that you normally think about when you talk about corporate branding. And uh, they published it and they went through several publications. It was a UK publisher that did it. It got into several universities. And then I thought, wow, that was fun. And then I started, I was one of the early users of the internet. And I started a weekly newsletter called the Monday Morning Marketing Memo. And every Monday morning, I'd write a, you know, about a 150 to 200 word memo and, you know, had people subscribing to it. And I took 50 of those and I turned them into a book called uh, Powerful Marketing Minutes. And it was basically the same things I've been sending out over the past year. And it just spun off from that. And my 21st book came out uh, in uh, June of 2020. What was the inspiration and the intention of writing your book? How stress and anxiety impact decision making? Well, it was twofold, Valeria. One of my previous book was called Better Decisions, Better Thinking, Better Outcomes. And it was it started because my father had early Alzheimer's disease before he passed away. And I'd been researching how to be his primary caregiver uh, and take care of his Alzheimer's and his heart problems. Um, and then when he passed away, I started wondering, well, is this genetic? Is it going to impact me? I live alone. You know, what's going to happen if my brain deteriorates? And so I did a lot of research into it. And the more I found out is that Alzheimer's and dementia dementia are really lifestyle diseases. Um, in fact, some scientists call Alzheimer's disease, uh, they call it diabetes type three. Um, and then that got me interested. And then I started talking to corporate leaders. So I, you know, I kept my foot in the leadership thing. I started talking to leaders about this and they all said, oh, I'll worry about it when I retire. Um, but then when I started telling them that their brain health impacts their decision making today, which impacts their bottom line, They start saying, um, sit down and talk to me. You know, let's talk about this more. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so that book came out. That book came out two years ago in 2018. And then now, because of the pandemic, because people being in lockdown and all the stress and anxieties happening, I took excerpts from that book and added some more research into it. And and this book is for the general public. It's for everybody, whereas the previous book was really aimed at leaders. So this is just how stress and anxiety impacts everybody. Uh, how we make bad decisions or less than optimal decisions when we're under stress and we're under anxiety, we get emotionally hijacked. And so that's how this book particularly came about. So it's a shorter book. It's a um, um, but really a book aimed at the general public rather than leaders. Is there such a thing as healthy stress? There is. Um, and, and, you know, athletes know this. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, people who've been in college know this. I mean, when you when you wait till last week to write your term paper, you, you get the adrenaline going, you get that short term rush, that short term right. stress and you put you in a flow. So short term stress can be good, right. uh, but prolonged stress and particularly the kind of prolonged stress that people are going through now during the lockdown and shelter in place uh, rules and laws, that's not healthy. So short term stress, if it gives you a boost, you know, that that can help you. I know I get nervous before I make a, a major speech and I give a public speech to six, seven hundred people. My palms sweat. And I, that's a good sign because I know that I'm going to get in the zone here. That, that That's a good kind of stress. It gets me focused. But if I don't want to go through the entire day with sweaty palms and, and <laughs> adrenaline racing through my body. True. So true. And that's what they call chronic stress, would you say? 
You know, there's 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 short term stress and then prolonged stress and then chronic stress. Chronic would be going on forever. So prolonged stress, like I said, would be happening to everybody right now. You know, how do you deal with working from home, children being educated from home, everyone's cooped up, you don't get to go outside, you know, that sort of stuff. That's kind of the prolonged stress. Chronic stress would be multiple years of, of various stress that happens to somebody. Being stressed, it's not a major issue. It's staying stressed. It's staying stressed or it's allowing that stress to blow up, to to emotionally hijack you. So the kind of thing where, you know, and you know, we're seeing that today. I mean, people fighting each other, one person wearing a mask and one person not wearing a mask, you know, people, you know, getting in traffic and then blowing their horns and cutting people off and road rage that, you know, that takes stress to the wrong point. Um, How is making decisions different from choosing? Oh, um, I guess there really probably isn't a real difference. Um, the, the, the maybe making decisions would be more if it's more strategic or important where you need to reflect on it more. I mean, we make, we make, uh, thousands of decisions every day from, you know, what to eat, how to brush our teeth, what, what do we put our right shoe on first or our left shoe on, or, you know, it, you know, we make thousands of decisions or choices every day. Um, so I'm not sure there's a huge difference between making a choice and making a decision, um, quite honestly. Yeah. So they are similar in a way, right? Yeah, I think so. Very, very much so. You just spoke about the emotions that they hijacked, the brains, the ability to think. How does it work exactly? And is this something that science has evidence for? Yes, there's been a lot of research on this, Valeria, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years because of the MRI or imaging technology that scientists can use to, to see the brain waves and what have you. So so when, when you get upset or w whatever, or, and by the way, w emotions aren't always negative. <laughs> we, being elated, being too happy, we can also make bad decisions. <laughs> True. Uh, 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 so, you know, you think, well, I'm on a winning streak. I'm going to go do this or, you know, and then, you know, and this is I, I grew up in Las Vegas. And so, you know, people get on a winning streak in the casinos. Uh, the, the casinos love that because they know they're going to keep playing and eventually the house will win. So, so, so as much as we always talk about negative emotions when it comes to decision making, positive, uh, positive emotions can be bad as well. But anyway, when, when the, when you get emotional, what if, whether that positive or negative, the amygdala, which is at the back of our brain, it starts to take over and it starts to secrete chemicals into our brain, particularly cortisol and happy, the happiness chemicals, adrenal cortisol and things like that. And uh, what it does is it takes over from the rational center of our brain, which is at the front of our brain called the prefrontal cortex. And this is when we make very bad decisions. And when this, and also when this happens, we stop listening to other people. We stop searching for other ideas. We can get into what we call binary decision making, which basically means we look for yes or no, A or B, black or white, one or two. And we're not looking, many times you need various options before you can make a more optimal decision, whether it's in the business world or, or personally. Uh, so. The way to control that, and this is the sciences have proven this now, they call it the eight second rule. When you consciously make a decision, when you know you're upset and you say, okay, Stephen, calm down, breathe. And this is where purposeful breathing comes in very much so. And you breathe, calm yourself down. It takes roughly eight seconds from that cognitive decision to, to become more rational for the front prefrontal cortex to take over from the amygdala. Interestingly, I don't know about you, but when I grew up as a kid, I was told, Stephen, when you get angry, you can't hit another child, count to 10, or you can't throw, you know, can't throw the block across the room, count to 10. Well, counting to 10 is roughly eight seconds. So, so that old, that old um, uh, urban legend or motherhood myth or whatever actually is now scientifically proven to be true. And so this is how we can control our emotions and get ourselves into a state to make better decisions. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I love the way you say you have the prescription for making better decisions. Pause, breathe, step back, take a short break, recalibrate, and then return. Yeah, I love those. Pause. That's the one. Pause. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? I, I've started using, I didn't use the term in the book, but as I've been speaking with people and, and doing some other writing of it, and, and I just mentioned purposeful breathing and that a lot of people talk about purposeful, purposeful breathing. I'm now telling people do a purposeful pause. 
Mm, yeah. Pause on purpose. Just pause. And one of my favorite phrases, and, and as a consultant, I use this a lot, and it's really beneficial, is when people say, what do you think about this? My immediate reaction now is, I think I need to take time to think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and rather than give somebody, and you know, all consultants, people always want an immediate answer from us and whatever, but rather than give somebody an immediate response, I'd rather say, you know what, I think I need to think about this. And so, you know, I did this few months ago when before I boarded an airplane and and I said to the person, look, I'm going to go on a two hour flight. I'll call you when I get off the plane. Man, when that flight took off and I sat there thinking about this person's issue and, and yes, what he had decided he was going to do was was an OK idea. But I thought of a better solution for him during that flight. When I called him back, I said, I think this is what you might want to consider doing. He said, oh, that's so much better. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, right. So I love the way you're saying that. Yeah, the pausing but with purpose just purposely pausing and that has a lot to do with what you talk in your book mid and towards the end meditation mindfulness and i have questions for you on that but before that i'm wondering if even by eating what we ingest like let's say caffeine this is something that i noticed for myself it doesn't put me in a in that space of making better decisions because I'm stressed almost. So would that influence too what we eat and drink? What we eat, what we drink, they're all chemicals, the way the body breaks them down. I think and each of us is different. Um, I, I will admit, uh, before I start writing, a couple of cups of coffee is good for me. Not not five, but right. two. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, about on the other hand, what's very interesting, and, and you know, you go through history, a lot of writers used to you know, drink alcohol and they thought they needed the alcohol to be creative. And of course, you know, when you get one drink in you or maybe two, you do, you know, the brains just start a bit more creative. But then they start abusing it. And um, so I find the same thing. If I have one or two cups of coffee and I quiet myself down and get into an environment where I can focus on my writing, the writing flows. I would never try to write having had a couple drinks of alcohol. But right. you know, for some writers, that works. For me, I don't think it would. Talk to me for a moment about decision making limitations. I'm very interested in the fear one because that's a big one for most of us. Fear. Yeah, we we often we we fear to repeat a mistake from the past. Um, we fear that the way other people might judge us, and quite frankly, we are sometimes our worst critics. So sometimes we'll fear that uh, we'll we'll self judge ourselves harshly, and all these fears lead to what we say in the business world: paralysis by analysis. We procrastinate. We don't want to make a decision, um, and we're always looking for new data, or new information, and and. But we have to understand not making a decision is a decision mm, in itself. True. And so we have to overcome those. We have to be first cognizant of those fears. We've been and be self-aware of what our fears are and then say, okay, am I am I am I not making this decision because in the past I did something and it and went wrong and now I'm fearful of that? Or you know, what what is what what's caused me to, to hold up here? Or, or do I really honestly need new information? But we have to be honest with ourselves. Talk to me about thinking and how thinking influences. We have talked about emotions and even food, what we drink, but the way of thinking. It kind of goes back, Valeria, to what I mentioned about the bina binary decision making. Well, let me give you an example, if I could. Um, I was in Fort Worth in December and running a leadership program. And normally we limit it to 24 people, but it was the end of the year and the client wanted to get more people. So I said, OK, 28 people I can handle. It's a four day program, four full days, very action packed, very intense program. At eight o'clock in the morning, I had 38 people sitting in that classroom. Um, something had gone wrong with the client's registration center. All 30 people thought they were registered for this class. They all made plans for the week to be there. At, and so I, during the coffee break, I sent a message to the client, said, hey, what's going on? I got 38 bodies in my room, blah, blah, blah. She calls me at lunch and says, and she was under a lot of stress. And her thinking was, A, I don't have the budget for this. B, tell those other 10 people to go home. Just send them home now. And I said, wait a second. Before you do that, do you realize that of those 10 people, three had flown in from Colorado, one had flown in from Baton Rouge, 
Two had driven in from Oklahoma and one had driven in from Kansas. And they'd all taken the week off. They all had hotel reservations, flight reservations there. So she was not making an optimal decision. She wasn't thinking well. She was she was under stress and you know, and she was looking for A or B, you know, kick them out. And and because because I can't run the class of 38 people, but I said to her, if you'll give me some an option, if I can change some of the normal things we do in the classroom. I can handle 38 people, but I'm going to have to make some changes. And she said, if you, if she, and she agreed to it. You know what? In retrospect, consider this. If they hadn't done this, this was December of 2019. In 2020, there's no classroom instruction going on. Those 10 people would not have gotten training till 2021 at the earliest, much less how would they have felt in front of their peers being told to go home after the lunch break? <laughs> So this is what I mean, it's how you think. It's not just what you mean. You know, she was thinking about budget. She was thinking about safety issues. She was thinking about um, uh, what happened with the registration system. But what, it, you know, she was going through all that rational corporate type thinking, but it, she wasn't how she was thinking. She wasn't seeing the bigger picture here. And that's what, and that's when I got her to calm down and be more mindful thinking about the situation. Then we made a more optimal decision that benefited the 10 employees plus the company. Meditation, mindfulness, is there a difference? I believe there is. I think you can be mindful without meditating. I mean, I can, just before we, we start talking, I got myself to be very mindful, thinking about the book, thinking about the questions, but I didn't go into a full meditation session. I just kind of got myself present, put my phone on airplane mode so we wouldn't be interrupted, got my bottle of water. You know, I'm very, I'm very present and I'm talking with you. I'm very present. I'm not thinking about anything else um, um, going on in my life or going on anywhere. So I'm very mindful. Meditation is, a, is to me, is a type of mind. Mindfulness. It's it's a, a practice. I do. I personally do practice meditation most days, not every day, but you know, I try and get into a routine of meditation. So I think there is a difference between the two. In your book, you say getting into the zone or into flow is one of the best outcomes of entering a mindfulness state. There, there's that. Athletes do it. Um, but I, and I think what prevents flow for many of us is interruptions. So, when, you know, you talk about me in writing. I write usually in three to three and a half hour bursts. I put my phone on airplane mode and I do it for one reason. When I every 50 minutes or so, I will get up to refresh my water or maybe make another cup of coffee or whatever. During that time, my mind in the background is still thinking about the book. If I looked at my phone, I looked at my messages, my emails of return phone calls, whatever, I was my mind would start thinking about those. And when we're really in the flow, when we're really concentrating on something, we get interrupted. Research shows that it takes over 20 minutes for us to get back 100% fully focused on something. So, uh, and we all know that you get interrupted by somebody and they go back and like, what was I doing? What was I writing about? What was I thinking about? Or in your case, uh, you know, what questions do I want to ask? How am I preparing? To stay in the flow, we have to minimize interruptions. So in your book, you also talk about some of the misconceptions of mindfulness the common myth. <laughs> Talk to me for a moment about that, Stephen. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I think, uh, and, and it's interesting how, how just in that, maybe the last three or four years, we see more executives and corporations uh, uh, taking mindfulness on board and understanding it. But, you know, it's not a new age hippie thing. It, um, you don't have to go on a 10 day silent retreat to become mindful. You don't have to practice yoga. You don't have to convert to Buddhism or anything else to, to, to practice e either mindfulness or meditation either one quite frankly I mean there's all these myths about it um, um, you know one of the things I I, I, I I when I first got into research and this understanding one of the things I really relish was I read somebody who said you don't have to sit in a lotus position to meditate I mean get in a position where your body is comfortable that's the most important thing and I love that because I personally I can't sit on the floor I can't sit on a futon <laughs> um, I can't sit there with my legs crossed I, I meditate quite honestly by lying down on my couch <laughs> um, but that works for me I, uh, or I meditate on an airplane sitting in an airplane seat but don't ask me to get into a lotus position <laughs> my knees can't do it. <laughs> do you have a time frame? Do you suggest like five, 10 minutes meditating or not really? It's up to us. I think it's up to every individual. I think start small. I mean, I, when I tell people in the classroom as I'm teaching this stuff, I will tell some, you know, try five minutes, try six minutes, just see what happens. And then, and then add to eight minutes. When I first started, 
I think I was doing five, six minutes. And then a few days later, I got it up to eight. And I think a week later, I was up to 10 minutes. And, you know, within about three weeks, I was up to about 32 minutes. And that suited me. And I found that um, going past 32 minutes really didn't seem to benefit me in any way. Um, um, so, yeah, I think we're all different. Um, and I think same thing time of day. I mean, some people like to meditate as soon as they wake up. They, they, that's, they start the day that way. Other people like to meditate midday. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a... Uh, I get up, my brain starts working immediately. I actually start working as soon as I wake up. I, but then I get burnt out about 10 o'clock or 10.30, and I tend to meditate around 11 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> which is probably unusual. <laughs> so what is the um, direct relationship between mindfulness and stress and reducing stress? Mindfulness, I think, is the best technique to reduce stress and get stress under control, to minimize stress and to minimize how you react to stress and and if you can get into mindful instead of reacting to stress i think you can respond to stress and that means you're you're doing so more con consciously more cognitively more rationally to whatever situation that you're facing um and look it's okay to have your emotions it's okay if, to be angry it's how you express that anger it's okay to be mad at somebody uh if they've upset you but how do you express being mad or how or, or how do you not express being mad right so i think that's what mindful does it, it allows you to slow down, to pause, to, to, to slow the adrenaline running through your system and get yourself into a more rational state and say, okay, the way I'm going to respond to this, I'm going to do it on purpose. I'm going to do it rationally. I'm going to do it cognitively rather than reacting to it emotionally. I'm wondering why so many of us resist this idea of pausing, of staying quiet. Why do you think that is? In the business world, I think it's seen as a weakness, quite frankly. I mean, what's interesting is when our bodies get tired, it's only to say, I'm going to take a nap or I'm going to rest for a few minutes. When our brains get overloaded and you tell somebody, I need to sit outside for five minutes in the sun and get my thoughts together. They'll go, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? Do you have a mental disease? I mean, it's not, it's not like <laughs> right. we, it's not socially acceptable. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, Good point. And I think we, I th again, it takes some courage. I think people need to do that, right, frankly. Um, but um, I just think we're rushing. I, I, also, I don't think enough people are educated on this. I mean, look, I first came across this concept maybe four years ago. Um, I've spent over 30 years in, in the corporate world. I spent over 20 years teaching leadership and, you know, it never, you know, I'd heard of meditation. I'd, I might've heard of the word mindfulness here and there, but I never really, never, no one ever brought it to my attention uh, until I started researching it. So I think that's part of it. People just have a, a lack of exposure to it. Plus those, some of those misconceptions of it that we talked about earlier. That's so interesting that you found this technique on your own, right, Stevie? Did somebody talk to you about it? No, I found it uh, actually in doing some research about Alzheimer's in the brain and decision making. Then I stumbled across some research that basically showed that uh, the Buddhist monks who meditate, that their brains were actually larger and uh, their stress levels were lower than other people the same age and whatever. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Then I come across another piece of research that linked mindfulness to uh, reducing stress and healthy, healthy lifestyle. And you know, it was just one research paper after the other. And, uh, and then I started reading books on mindfulness and and uh, and meditation and uh, I kind of I I'd had a so I'd done meditation maybe 10 years ago a guided meditation from a lady in the UK and I went back and, and listened to the tapes that she had sent me and I thought wow this is I I see a lot of benefit in this and then I started using it um and uh, my blood pressure reduced uh, fairly quickly. Um, I got off my blood pressure medicines that I was on at the time. So I thought, that, wow, this is this is really important stuff. And so I, I started putting it in the books. And, um, people appreciated it. You talk a lot about leadership, but I have to ask you this question too. What is your definition for leadership? What is to be a great, true leader? Well, my definition of great leadership is, is really quite straightforward. And, um, it's, it's one I practice. I think that great leadership is an art. I think it's the art of achieving progress through the involvement and the actions of others. 
Uh, and that's why a great leader is strong in both leading people and leading for results. And I'm very specific in the words I use, achieving progress. It's not achieving results because a great leader knows that even if the team doesn't achieve the goals that we set out for this quarter or this year, the team has to function well for the following year to, to, to have a better chance of achieving those goals. So it's not always about achieving a specific outcome, but it's about achieving progress through the involvement and through the actions of others. You said that dark chocolate reduces stress. <laughs> I mean, we love dark chocolate, so. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, you have to add the words in moderation, Valeria. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> like, every, like everything right. else in life, yeah. No, but dark chocolate does have, uh, it does have some chemicals in it, again, as our body breaks it down, and, is, and it does help reduce, reduce stress, reduce anxiety levels. But again, uh, it doesn't mean you can go out and eat uh, six pounds of chocolate or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Or I'm stressed. I'm going to eat. <laughs> That's called binge eating. <laughs> right, right. That's another problem. <laughs> another problem. Another stress. <laughs> right. So I have a few more questions for you. I call them final questions. Before that, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? Uh, not a passage, but um, just if anybody has a question, I mean, reach out to me. My email is straightforward. It's Stephen at calianteleadership.com. I'll respond to you within 48 to 72 hours. Um, uh, my website, you can reach it, reach me through calianteleadership.com website. So I'm, I'm kind of evangelistic about this. I want to help people spread the word. And I'm looking for other people who want to also spread this word that we can reduce stress, we can reduce anxiety, and we can make better decisions. What is success to you? What is to be successful? Ah, success to me is, is really learning something new. I, one of my favorite phrases I use is it's, it's a good day when you learn something. Uh, I never stop learning because life never stops teaching. So I, I want to be a, a better person than I was yesterday, both as a human and, and as a soul. So that's success. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing, leaving the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything differently? I would. I mean, if, if, if by soon you mean three to six months or less than a year. So, yeah, I would I would start I would I would take my girlfriend. I would travel and have some memorable experiences with her that she would treasure beyond my passing. And I would also um, I'd want to help her just prepare for her to move on without me, quite frankly. Uh, we have a great relationship. But yeah. uh, if, if that was to happen to me in, over the short term, it's it's uh, I'm sure it would be something that she would struggle to deal with. My last question is, what are three things about life you know for sure as of now? I believe life is interconnected, uh, at least at a humanity and a soul level. I, I'm not sure about animals and plants and that sort of stuff. I know other people have given that some thought. I haven't. Um, I would say number two, purposeful breathing is essential uh, to have a healthy life. Um, and people need to learn how to, you know, there are various breathing techniques. So purposeful breathing is, is really, and I think that our growth, our growth as humans and our growth as a soul, again, is a process of breaking free from uh, what I would call the trappings of the ego. I think the ego steers us in the wrong direction so many times. So to grow as a person, to grow as a soul, we got to break free from that ego. I mentioned earlier this constant battle between the soul and the ego. We, sorry, the ego, not the ego, this constant battle. The soul has to win out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen, for your wisdom, your presence. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you very much. I'll ask you the question again. I know you mentioned your website earlier, but please mention again. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? The books are all on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle. Just look up the book, um, How Stress and Anxiety Impacts Your Decision, or just look up Steve books by Stephen Howard, Stephen with a V and an N. Um, Stephen at calianteleadership.com. Caliante is the Spanish word for hot, but it also means a second definition of, of uh, Caliante is passionate, and I'm passionate about leadership. So I named my company Caliante Leadership. Also, where I live, the uh, the uh, Agua Caliante Band of Indians owns the land. So it's kind of my tribute to our Native American uh, landowners as well. So calianteleadership.com or Stephen at calianteleadership.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you. You have a great podcast, and I hope people enjoy listening to it. Thank you, Stephen. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Stephen Howard and his work, please visit calienteleadership.com.
To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. I want to thank the Patreon members, Lawrence McGrath, Mark Basden, Terry Clayton, and Aidan Vickrock. Thank you again for listening, and bye for now.